Now, if you're going to be working in any type of Microsoft administration services these days, there are some fundamental principles that are very important that you understand. So what I want to do is I want to get into some of the foundations of understanding things like Microsoft domains, understanding some of the networking technologies, RAS and VPNs and virtualization, and also we're going to talk about the cloud services and how all that fits into this. But it's important to kind of start from the beginning so you can understand where things have been, understand where things are going, and you have to consider the fact that you know we're, the world is transitioning now more into a cloud-oriented uh, environment, but in the past everything was managed on-prem or on-premise, and we got to talk about this transition and how things were and how things are now and where Microsoft is going. So to start with, you know, we go back go back in time to the 1950s, 1960s. They had mainframes, these gigantic computers that would take up like entire rooms. Uh, they used vacuum tubes. And then as we moved into the 1970s, something miraculous happened. They created what was known as an IC, an integrated circuit, which allowed uh, basically binary math to be processed through little chips and this is where personal computing became popular so in the 1980s personal computers started coming out I'm gonna draw this little symbol here to represent a computer and uh, I tell you what I'm gonna create another little uh, symbol here to kind of represent a bunch of computers so in the 1980s companies started buying PCs and personal computers and they started showing up in people's offices and eventually you know they were networking them together and all of that and so this is where things really get started now of course in in those days one of the problems was we we lived in what was called a peer-to-peer -peer network so what would happen is these computers were you could network these computers together with various technologies but um, there was no centralization, meaning each computer was equal. There was no computer that controls all the other computers. A network admin would have to, uh, if they wanted to make changes, they'd have to sit down at each and every computer to make those changes or get users to help them, which was always a nightmare. Um, and so that didn't, you know, it worked, but it didn't work very efficiently. All right. Now, as we moved into the 1990s, there was a, a company. That kept that was gaining ground called Novell, Novell, and they had a product called Netware, which was the idea of that was to use a server that would help manage uh, machines and also allow people to share files easier. Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer network back originally, these machines would have to share files with each other, and people would have to know each other's passwords. It just didn't work very well. Well, eventually, with the creation of the file server concept, you had a more powerful machine that you could share files on and all that. And eventually Novell even came out with the idea of a server that could manage other machines. Now this is kind of where Microsoft comes in. Microsoft created their product called NT and they created this uh, concept of a domain controller which is a special type of server that can manage these other servers. Now fast forward they came out with what was known as a domain but fast forward to the year 2000 Microsoft releases their newest domain technology and they call it uh, Active Directory and Active Directory domains were represented by a triangle alright and a domain controller was a a server essentially that had a database on it and that database was the Active Directory database so let's just kinda fix that here this little cylinder looking thing I'm gonna make here is gonna represent my Active Directory database so uh, AD alright um, and this was is what we still call to this day we call it ADDS Active Directory Domain Services and usually if you hear that term uh, Active Directory Domain Services it means it's an on-premise domain Although there is a version of this that can be hosted in the cloud known as Azure Active Directory Domain Services. I'm not getting into that right now. So anyway, um, you would always want to have more than one domain controller. You, the reason you want to have more than one domain controller is because the same reason you have more than one of any type of, of server really. One reason being 
um, to break up the disbursement of load, these machines will authenticate with these domain controllers. And the more machines you got, uh, you know, you don't want all of that just going to one domain controller, right? The other consideration is redundancy. If you only have one and that server goes down, well, you're in trouble, right? So we want to have multiple. The other thing about domain controllers that are interesting is that they replicate. So, uh, for example, let me make a, I'm going to make a little smiley face guy here. And this little smiley face guy is going to represent uh, my a user. So we create a user account on a domain controller. Now, the interesting thing about user accounts or the interesting thing really about domain controllers is that they replicate so everything you do on one uh, will replicate over to the other so if I create a user account on that first one well replication is going to occur between uh, both of them and so this little arrow thing I'm going to make here is going to represent replication so domain controllers replicate that means that this user could log on to any one of these thousands of machine and it's going to you know, authenticate with the uh, domain controller, all right? The authentication protocol that uh, is used is the protocol known as Kerberos, all right? Kerberos is the authentication uh, protocol. What is a protocol? It's like a language, basically, okay? Uh, now, there was an older protocol that that uh, that it also supported called NTLM. That was for legacy, for older prior to the year 2000 machines. Now, the um, that protocol allowed us to have encrypted passwords and all that and authenticate securely and all that fun stuff. The other thing is, is Active Directory uses a language um, known as the Directory Service Language, and that language was called LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Now, all that is, again, this is all decades old at this point. Um, at the time when it came out, it was cutting edge, but it's, it is a bit dated nowadays. Uh, but it still works and it's still pretty secure, though there are some considerations on security that I'm not going to explain right now. Now, the other thing that's important about Active Directory is that all machines have to have a name. And the name must be, of course, associated with an IP address and, and all of that. And so there is a service that we use that we use it on the Internet all the time called DNS, Domain Name Service. Our, our uh, domain must have a name. Usually when you name your domain, you would name it after your company, and a lot of people even name their domains based on their web presence. So, for example, my domain might be called examlabpractice.com. That's my company, my web presence. And um, I'm going to need to have a, a server in my domain that can associate the names and IP addresses together. So that server is called a DNS server. DNS, Domain Name System Server. And that server will also have to have a little database on it. And that database will be our DNS database. Okay. So we'll just draw another little cylinder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this, border it with red, and then I'm going to color code the database red, which means that this database, the DNS database, is associated with that name. Now what happens is our machines clients, domain chores, we also might even have, let's, let's draw a file server over here. Pretty common that we have file servers in our environment. Okay, um, all of these machines would register with our DNS. All right, and this allows for the centralization of name resolution, meaning they register their IP addresses into this database and then now, anytime a machine needs to find another machine, it can query DNS. So, for example, these machines all have to authenticate by your domain controllers. They can query DNS and say, hey, DNS, do you know what the uh, address is of one of my domain controllers so I can authenticate? And DNS can reply back and say, yeah, here is the information. At that point, the client can go and authenticate. So it works very efficiently. Now, all of this together... This, this idea of domain controllers, this triangle you see here, this provides centralization. So we, we moved away from peer-to-peer -peer networking back in the day where you know every machine was kind of its own boss and there was no centralized way of managing things to now we are working in a centralized environment. These domain controllers help us centralize. This DNS service help, helps us centralize. So we now have some central control over things. One of the great things about our 
uh, domain controllers too, is we have these wonderful things called GPOs, group policy objects. A group policy object is this object that you can create that has all these settings, parameters, uh, you know, any type of attribute you want to configure or change in, on machines, you can do it through a GPO. So for example, if your boss walks up to you and says, hey, I want you to um, force the firewalls to be turned on all these machines. I want to make sure that the antivirus is always up to date. Uh, I want you to disable some of the, the wallpaper feature. I don't want people you, uh, putting crazy wallpapers on their machine. Um, so, I mean, you could, the sky's the limit. There are literally thousands of things you can do inside of a GPO. But what happens is that GPO can instruct these machines to turn things on and turn things off. GPOs also replicate. So when you create a GPO on a domain controller, it replicates over to the other domain controller. So it doesn't matter which machines you know, authenticate with which domain controller. All right, so these GPOs can be deployed out to these machines, and this is how you turn things on, turn things off. You could even deploy software with that if you wanted to. So it was, a, it was very, very powerful, um, a very, very powerful system for managing everything. All right, uh, of course, let's let's throw the internet into the mix here. Let's say that this little cloud is going to represent the, uh, you know, the internet, and um, let's talk about kind of a little bit about how that sort of fits into the picture. Let me just clean it up here with the mighty stroke of my paintbrush. I will clean up the internet. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so then we have the internet, right? So maybe we've got an internet connection that's coming in here. All right, and of course you don't want to just leave your internal network exposed, so your company would generally have a firewall, right? Um, and we would, we'll just put that firewall right here. And so now we have... Um, you know, a secure way for traffic to flow out to the internet and uh, the only things that can come in would be things that we send out and we could allow things through that firewall if we want to. Now this is a traditional domain. This is the way we've done things for 20 years, all right? Um, and in this next little section I want to talk about uh, expansion on all of this and where where things have gone with things like RAS and all that and VPN and virtualization. So um, that'll wrap this little section up and we'll move on to the next. I now want to talk about some concepts that are also sort of the foundation of how we've done things over the years. It's important to understand how we've done things over the years so we can understand how uh, things are now. So looking back we have an Active Directory domain, ADDS as it's called, Active Directory Domain Services, which uses the LDAP Lightweight Director Access Protocol, which uses Kerberos for authentication or for this older, for the legacy back in the 90s devices that used NTLM, a new technology land manager, which is, isn't all very new these days. But uh, even Kerberos is pretty old con uh, considering, you know, we've been using it for, for decades and I think actually the protocol even came out back in the 1980s. So, you know, so we got some data technologies, but the technologies have been updated a lot of them over the years to be secure. So you can still feel comfortable using those. But let's talk about some different scenarios now. Um, the first thing I want to look at is the scenario of what happens when we have a user who is not at the office. So this person is working from home. Working from home is a lot more popular nowadays than it has been in the past. So it's very common. And this person needs the ability, perhaps, to you know be able to connect in and access uh, services that are inside. Okay, um, and we've got a file server, but you know ultimately, we we you probably are aware that you know in the past um, it was always this mindset of do it yourself, host your own server. So you know your companies might have they might have a file server. But then they might also have a, um, you know, they might be, they might have a SQL database server that that users need to access. Let's let's create that SQL. All right. Um, maybe uh, Microsoft Exchange. That was email, right? Microsoft Exchange was, uh, you know, used for email, and then maybe even like SharePoint was very popular. 
by Microsoft on premise. So here you've got these, you know, these four servers providing a service to our devices, and um, you've got users working from home and everything else needing to get access to those. Let me just kind of move those a little bit over here, make a little bit of room here, and I'm going to shrink those down just a little bit as well. All right. So th this user who is working from home needs to access these services, but the person is not, uh, you know, not around. Well, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just open up all the ports on the firewall and allow this person in to get access to these um, devices unsecurely. In fact, in the 90s, a lot of companies did that. The very first company I ever worked for uh, back in the 90s, they didn't really have a firewall, so you literally could share out your, you had a public address and uh, you could connect to it from home. It was really scary when I think about it. Even in the 90s, that was scary. But nowadays, it's incredibly scary. Why is it scary? Because you got these people out there that want to do things that um, they shouldn't do and, and you know, get access to companies' data and, and try to do damage and ransom and all of that, ransomware and all that. And, and who are these people? Well, we, we generally call them hackers, right? So let me draw a little hacker, this, uh, this little... This little uh, box here is going to represent my hacker. All right, and let's make him. Let's make this hacker look like he's up to no good. All right, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna give him like a. Let's give him like a devil horns. Some devil horns here, and maybe like, uh, you know, he's he's in a bad mood. I'm gonna give him a frowny face. And give him some fangs and. Maybe the fangs are dripping blood every... Okay, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I get carried away. All right. But uh, anyway, that's going to be my hacker, all right? Goofy-looking little hacker person, all right? And um, so we don't want this hacker, like, spying on my user. We don't want this hacker getting access to resources inside. So how do we get around that? Well, usually the way we would do that is you would use a VPN, a virtual private network. So... The way you would do that is you could purchase what was called a VPN concentrator. And basically, it's a device that um, allows secure connections in. But in the Microsoft world, we actually had a type of server we could set up uh, called a RAS server, or also known as an RRAS server because it stood for Routing and Remote Access Services. But um, anyway, Remote Access Services is the idea here. And with that, we have support for VPN. Now, what does that do? This allows this thing called a VPN tunnel to be created, which means that you have this encrypted communications that goes through to that RAS server. And then from there, that RAS server allows you to access other resources securely. This hacker will not be able to see the, um, the traffic that's flowing through because it's all encrypted. The only thing the hacker would be able to see is that it was going up to this firewall, and that would be it wouldn't be able to see what the traffic said. So this is how we would we would definitely help secure things. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about here is what happens when a company needs to have a service that is exposed to the internet. For example, let's say that your company is going to host their own web server. Okay, so you set up a web server. All right. Maybe this is going to be www.examlabpractice.com or whatever, and people from the internet need to be able to get to it anonymously. Um, well, how are you going to do that? Where are you going to put that web server? Are you going to put it internally inside the domain like you see here? And the reason that's scary is because you'd have to open up port 443, port 80, which is HTTP, HTTP ports, to allow traffic to get in, which means... Not only could you know somebody out there on the internet anonymously get into this web server, but technically so could a hacker. And if a hacker was ever to gain access over this website by hacking it, then something called pivoting could occur, where a hacker could actually gain access to these other services that are on your network. And so that's where things are really scary. So you definitely won't want to host it internally most of the time, although there was a way to do something called a reverse proxy. I won't get into that right now. But we would probably want to put this outside, right? So we'd want to put it out here. Um, but there's something else that's a problem on that. If you put it outside that firewall, you don't have to worry about you know people getting you know allowing traffic to come in. But the only that the scary thing about that is the fact that this poor web server is now completely exposed to the internet, so with no protection. So the way around that 
usually is people would get another firewall. So you'd have two firewalls. This first firewall was, would be called the uh, internal connected firewall, and then you, this firewall here would be called the external connected firewall. Now this little network between that, we would call that a DMZ, demilitarized zone, or now the more popular term is perimeter network. Okay, so DMZ, perimeter network are basically the same thing. All right, um, and so now what you would do is you'd only open, you would only open the ports like port 80, 443, 53 for DNS if you put DNS in there, uh, whatever ports there that you need, and now traffic would be able to get to this web server. Okay, um, and so uh, even if a hacker you know somehow hacks this web server, you're not going to allow traffic to pass through this firewall and get to these resources. The only traffic that you might allow would be VPN. Okay. Um, and, and there's a bunch of authentication and all that that has to happen to make that work. All right, so that's the idea of remote access and VPNs in a nutshell for you, as well as the concept of DMZ and uh, the perimeter network idea. Uh, now, the, the final thing I wanna look at with you um, in this video is the idea of virtualization. So I talked about how in the past, uh, it was always the, the mindset was we got to host everything ourselves. We got to have our own little data center. We got to have our, you know, we got to have our own servers, file, server, SQL, Exchange, SharePoint, all that. And it's all got to be hosted by us. And that's the way things have always been done. All right. Um, now, uh, then what you'll find is, is as time went on, uh, a company called VMware came out with a uh, a way of expanding on virtualization. Just so you know, virtualization is not a new term. Virtualization has been around for a very long time. In fact, the term hypervisor is the essentially the software that lets us emulate hardware. And if you can emulate hardware, you can also store software on that emulated hardware. That's the idea of virtualization. Um, that term hypervisor has been around since the 1970s. The idea of even mainframes dividing up processing time and doing shared computing was a form of virtualization. So this is not a new concept, but VMware, they expanded on this idea and the and the, the thing that they did that really pushed the envelope on all this was that, hey, you don't necessarily need four different servers. And here's the other thing, here's the other crazy thing. If you wanted redundancy for those four servers, you'd really need eight servers, right? And you could do clustering those together. So you'd have eight servers to provide redundancy for those. But with, with uh, virtualization, I can set up a hypervisor server, one server, and, and, and virtualize those other servers. Now, in the Microsoft world, we call that Hyper-V. That is the, the software that does this, Hyper-V, hyper, Hypervisor. Uh, Microsoft's not the one that came up with that. VMware's not the first to ever come up with that. VMware was the biggest contributor to this concept, though, so I do have to give them credit where credit is due. All right, now the other beautiful thing, though, about this is you get a really, really powerful machine. You virtualize your um, machines on those. You get these things called um, checkpoints in Microsoft. They used to be called snapshots, and a lot of other companies still call them snapshots, where you can make changes without the worry of breaking anything because you can revert back to before the change was made. The other thing that's wonderful about um, using virtualization is if I want to com uh, have complete redundancy, I don't have to have eight servers. I could literally you know, purchase another server and have a copy of the virtual machines on that other server. Now I've only got two servers as opposed to having to have uh, a total of eight servers. Okay, so this is a very powerful feature capability that kind of uh, started everything. Another thing that we got, and, and this is kind of where you start thinking about cloud computing, is with virtualization comes the, the term elasticity, which basically means that each of these machines can be given a certain amount of RAM processing power. But here's what's interesting about that. If one of the servers isn't using all of the available RAM that it's been given, it can share it with other servers. So for example, this file server has been given more RAM than it needs and then SQL needs that RAM, the file server can give up some of that RAM over to SQL. And when SQL's done using that extra memory, it can release it back to everybody 
it's basically a pool type scenario where it gets released into a pool of RAM and pool of CPU and they can grow and shrink as they need and that's the, the a small way of sort of uh, on-premise way of looking at elasticity of course when you get into cloud computing you'll learn that that can expand across multiple machines across the you know the, the board in these big data centers but not to get into that just yet here but that's the idea hopefully that now helps you with understanding that concept of what virtualization is and with that is really where you know cloud computing started to come into play which I'm not explaining in this video but hopefully now you have a much better understanding of the concept of, of the RAS VPN as well the DMZ uh, concepts and virtualization and now we'll in this next section we'll start getting into the concept of cloud services now with the creation of virtualization this got companies thinking hmm if we can emulate hardware we can create this uh, these virtual machines and we can store software on that we can have operating systems running on that emulated hardware the operating systems being called guest operating systems we could technically host these virtual machines for companies for a price as a service so the idea being you know hey you pay us uh, a fee each month and we'll host your virtual servers and you don't have to deal with all the headaches of you know hosting your own data center on premise and the power that's needed to do that and the air conditioning that's needed to do that all the hardware that's needed to do that as well as the knowledge of how all the hardware works so this is essentially what a cloud company brings to the table so various companies like Google and IBM and Microsoft and Apple and, and all these these companies a lot of them already had uh, tons of data centers these big massive warehouses all over the world that they could support it. Some of these companies, such as Microsoft and IBM and uh, uh, Amazon, and Amazon being one of the, the biggest and first, uh, decided to open this up to the public for a fee and allow you to host um, your services in their data centers. So this is where cloud computing really comes into place. So this, this big cloud here is going to represent uh, cloud computing mainly the Microsoft cloud computing and of course it's all connected to the internet with incredibly fast high-speed internet connections fiber connections and all of that um, so there's some terminology or some acronyms I want to talk a little bit about real fast here as we get into this um, first off in cloud computing there is an acronym we call IAAS that stands for infrastructure as a service okay infrastructure as a service means that a provider is is hosting all of the hardware infrastructure for you and then they are going to provide you with a way for you to interact with that hardware and utilize their hardware as a service all right um, and this of course is where Azure comes into play Microsoft Azure now you might pronounce that word different people have different ways of saying Azure some people call it Azure some people call it Azure some people call it uh, I've even heard it called Azure before uh, Azure <laughs> there's various names for it. in fact uh, years ago when I was first learning Azure I decided I wanted to make sure I was, I was pronouncing this correctly so I was like I'm gonna go to watch the developers so I started watching videos of the the developers the the people who created Azure and uh, I figured I would determine the very first video I ever watched the guy was pronouncing it the word Azure so that's how I say it but what I further learned is that um, the Microsoft developers don't agree on how to say it either uh, some of them say Azure some of them call it Azure uh, some of them call it Azure so anyway tomato tomato pronounce it however you want to pronounce it okay but Azure is Microsoft's main IAAS system what this is is Microsoft is going to host they've got all these uh, data centers all over the world and they're gonna host their hardware so that you can host on top of their hardware your virtual machines or whatever it is so you can host virtual machines Microsoft will also allow uh, you to have access to what are called virtual appliances like uh, virtual firewalls uh, also virtual load balancing software because you can get um, you get access to what are called VNets 
This is virtual networking, so you can create these virtual networks based on TCP IP that are running your, you know, in their cloud service with virtual machines on it, and then you can put a virtual firewall. So you can almost like recreate what you're seeing here in an on-premise environment. You can recreate that in the cloud. Um, they also provide uh, virtual storage, so you can store data and backup data out there. Um, they support uh, database hosting, all of that. That's all part of IaaS. Now with IaaS, the, the model for that, for the most part, is you pay for what you use. So there's a, a, a an algorithm that looks at how much memory, how much processing power, how much storage that's being used, and then you, you get a fee each month for what you're using. The good news is they do have a, a calculator that kind of helps you forecast this. And um, you can even set uh, alarms to let you know if you're approaching a certain budget that you got on calls. There's a lot of things out there to help you do that. But that's the idea. You pay for what you use. Okay, now there is another couple of terms I want to mention as well. This next term is called platform as a service. And then there's a third term called software as a service. So platform as a service, uh, P-A-A-S, and software as a service, platform as a service, uh, and software. Let me explain software as a service first, because that'll be it's pretty easy to visualize, and then I'll explain platform as a service. So the idea of software as a service is uh, basically they have applications that can be hosted in the cloud service apps, if you will. These apps are a hundred percent ready to use, ready for you to take advantage of. All you gotta do is use those applications. Okay. For example, Microsoft has what's called Office for the Web, or it used to be called Office Online. So that's like Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. You can run it from within your web browser. Uh, you, you know, all you got to do is just jump right in and, and use it. And so from an admin standpoint, all we have to do is you know assign the users that are allowed to, to use that, and they can go use it, and it's available to them 100%. All they got to do is start using it. There's not really a lot of administration for us now. What is platform as a service? Well, platform as a service is a system in which um, the majority of the, the configuration is done for us, but we still have some admin configuration we have to do to use it. For example, with, with virtual machines, this is 100% IaaS. A virtual machine is, it's a you can put whatever operating system on there, but you're responsible for the operating system. You're responsible for the software that goes on it. You as an admin have to manage all that. Okay. With platform as a service, virtual machines are set up in the background that you don't have any control over. They've already put the operating system on there. They've already put the software on there. You don't have any control over any of that, but there's still some administration you have to do uh, in order to control it. For example, um, Microsoft has a directory service called Azure AD. Now this is a big deal. This is probably one of the biggest deals of the things I've gone over so far in this cloud. Azure Active Directory is what we call a platform as a service. It is a directory service that is sort of the cloud version of what you have here called uh, uh, ADDS. So um, now I remember when I first heard about Azure a Active Directory, I thought, oh, well this is just like you're just hosting virtual domain controllers in the cloud. No, they have completely redone the concepts of Active Directory. It is completely redone with all new web-based programming languages. It does not use any of the dated stuff like LDAP and Kerberos and all that. It uses industry standard authentication uh, protocols in order to support all the latest and greatest features and capabilities in the cloud. Okay, And so these are where users, passwords, all of that stuff is going to be managed in the cloud. But it starts out with almost nothing in it. So it's ready to use, but you as an admin have to start creating users and, and all of that. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. What if I want to use my on-premise users in the cloud? Well, stand by. I'll explain that in a second. Anyway, Azure AD is a platform as a service. So is, here's another one, Exchange Online. Microsoft has Exchange Online. That's a, that's a, a, that is actually both a, a platform as a service and a software as a service in that um, the admin side of it is the platform as a service, but the user side is the software as a service. Same thing for SharePoint Online. Microsoft has 
uh, SharePoint online as well. Same idea there. All right. And then you've got Microsoft Teams. That's a the the admin side of that is a platform as a service, but the user side of that is a software as a service. Um, there is uh, OneDrive for Business. That's a, a cloud storage that we have access to that uh, allows users to store their data out there in the cloud. There is a product called Intune, which is Microsoft's uh, MDM product. MDM, it's also MAM product, so it's, it's both. A mobile device management, that allows us to manage devices. This is one of the most powerful things we have uh, available to us. This is what sort of is, is replacing the concept of GPOs. This is going to allow us to manage our device settings. Not only can we manage on-premise devices, but we can manage mobile devices. GPOs can only manage devices for Windows. With Intune, we can manage Windows, Android, iOS, iPad OS, Mac OS, all that stuff. Um, with the help of Intune, we can manage the settings and restrictions. We can deploy software. This is a very, very powerful product okay, that we have available to us. Um, it even has a thing called Autopilot, which will allow us to reconfigure uh, Windows machines and all of that. So very, very powerful stuff that uh, we have available to us. All right. Um, now, I will tell you that Azure has... Um, Azure definitely has some of the, uh, you know, it has some platform as a service technologies and some software as a services technologies. But the the main um, the main type of system that Microsoft has created for platform as a service and software as a service is called Microsoft 365. Okay, Microsoft 365. All right which I forgot to add to my display here. We actually do have apps that are called the Microsoft 365 apps. All right. Which formally they would call them Office 365 apps. They're now, you know, starting to call them Microsoft 365 apps, but the Microsoft 365 services is it's it is a a cloud service that basically sits on top of Azure. So you've Azure in the, the, the background of all this and the Microsoft 365 sitting on top of it. All right. You can't have a Microsoft 365 um, account or tenant that doesn't also have Azure. Azure is um, in the background no matter what. And the other thing to be aware of is both of these share Azure AD. So that you'll notice that you, you there are web portals for creating users and things through Microsoft 365 or creating users through Azure. It all ties back to Azure AD. You're going to see the same users no matter what. So these two things are glued together, basically. Okay, they're glued together. Now, on Microsoft 365 with PaaS and SaaS and all that, you're not really going to be hosting virtual machines, but you're going to, you're going to be working with um, these services. Let's just kind of color code some of this real quick. All right. Now again, I do want to add that Azure does have PaaS and SaaS services that I'm not getting into right now, but it's mainly an IaaS-based service. That's that's its main focus. Microsoft 365 uh, is strictly PaaS related and, and software as a service, SaaS related. It doesn't really have any virtual machines or any of that, though it can interact with them. Okay, um, so if I was to sort of draw a circle around some of these. All of this stuff you see here would be, this would be uh, Azure related. And then all of this stuff you see right here would be the Microsoft 365 related. Now, um, they both share Azure AD. So I'm going to put a pur purple circle around that. Red and blue make purple. <laughs> all right. Um, and so they, they all link to that. Okay, and so that is how uh, Microsoft handles that those concepts. The other thing about 
Azure is with Azure, you're paying for the CPU, RAM, storage you use. With Microsoft 365, it's all based on licenses. So you, you purchase these subscriptions that have a certain amount of licenses, and you issue these licenses out to your users, and your users can take advantage of these various features. Okay. One more thing I want to explain here, and that is what about the issue of what if we want to uh, use our on-premise users to access resources in Azure? Well, Microsoft has a solution for that. They actually have a type of server that you can set up, and the server is called an Azure AD Connect server. Azure AD Connect. Now, what does this do? An Azure AD Connect server, this is a synchronization-based system, and what it will do is it will allow uh, my on-premise users to be synchronized out to Azure AD. Now, it does not allow Azure AD users to be synced in, only out, but it will allow user passwords and all of that uh, to be synced in. So if a user is uh, if a user is logging on to Azure AD and they change their password out in the cloud, it'll it can it does have the ability to synchronize that password back in. But the beauty of this is is by going this route, if you have this on-premise environment, um, you can achieve what we call SSO. What is SSO? Single sign-on. The idea of single sign-on with all of this is my user can sit down at their on-premise computer, they can log on, and it's going to log them on both in the cloud as well, as, or sorry, it's going to log them on on-premise as well as in the cloud at the same time. All right? and uh, they can access resources out there. The other thing I'll tell you is that Microsoft has moved into a way to where you could actually, you could technically not even have a domain nowadays. You don't necessarily have to have a domain. In fact, it, it pains me to say this as a consultant because, you know, I have fed my family for, you know, two decades by uh, using Active Directory, both teaching it as well as, um, you know, consulting on it. But I'll be honest, Microsoft is now moving in a direction to where domains are not even needed anymore. Um, they're now making it possible to where everything can be managed through your cloud service and domains are not needed. But if, if you're a company that's already got a domain and all this is still in place and all of that, then this Azure AD Connect server is going to be the thing that's going to help you. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully this has now uh, helped you have a better understanding. This was really just a fundamentals video um, to help you understand the cloud service, the concepts of it. And I hope that this has been helpful to you. Now, one of the first things that, that you got to keep in mind when you're dealing with uh, operating systems is, well, how am I going to deploy that operating system? And what are the tools that are available? And before you can jump in and start working with hands-on, it's very important that you understand the concepts of what's available in terms of deployment tools. So I want to kind of go through that with you right now. Here we are uh, looking at um, some, some information on deployment tools and what are the different uh, deployment options that are available. So, the, of course, the first thing we could do is we could just do the good old-fashioned fresh install or or what's called a high-touch installation, or some people refer to it as a high-touch deployment. And that is basically just taking a copy of Windows on a flash drive, or if you still have DVDs, you could use a DVD, and you could pop that into a computer, and you could uh, boot off that flash drive or off that DVD or whatever, and you could install Windows fresh on the computer. You, you can, it's bootable, so you could boot off of it. You could blow away whatever's on the hard drive, and install the operating system fresh. Now, the great thing about that is it's easy. There's, it is, there doesn't take a lot of technical abilities, a lot of setup. It's great if you're just going to install one or two machines. Now, of course, when you start getting into the concepts of, well, you know, what happens if I've got to deploy a lot of machines? What, you know, what if I got to do 20 or 30 or 50 machines, you know, at a time? 
um, then that's where the fresh install kind of falls apart. Number one, you don't want to be running around with 50 flash drives in your hand or 50 DVDs and popping them in computers and installing. But number two, one of the other issues that you run into there is that um, it's not going to install any applications. You're just going to get the fresh install of the operating system. So what if you, you know, what if your boss walks up to you and says, "Hey, I need to deploy 50 machines. We need uh, these 50 machines set up by next week sometime." And of course, you got to do it as quickly as possible. Running around with 50 flash drives or, or DVDs or whatever is probably not going to be the quickest way to get that done, right? So there are other options. You have uh, imaging, of course, uh, imaging using Windows ADK uh, and the MDT, which I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. But um, so this uh, Windows ADK, which we're going to talk about more, and the MDT we're going to talk about more. But the Windows ADK is the Windows Assessment and Deployment Toolkit. This is uh, essentially a um, a tool that is, or a toolkit that's going to basically bring a bunch of tools and make those tools available for you. It's one download. It's free. You download it off Microsoft's website. You get it for free. It extracts all these tools and it makes these tools available for you to uh, you utilize imaging. Okay, uh, and this is uh, this. You can also download what is called MDT, the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, to go with that. And, the way you, you sort of want to look at it is the MDT, the Microsoft uh, Deployment Toolkit, is like a, a workbench. So imagine that you're gonna you're a, a, a carpenter or something, and you're gonna build something. Okay, um, the MDT is like your workbench. Okay, uh, it's it's a, it's a space to help you organize this whole process of imaging. Okay, and then the Windows ADK is the various tools and, if you will, machinery that would be used, right? If you were a carpenter and you were building something, you'd have various machines to help you do that, various tools to help you do that. The Windows ADK is, is what that is. So it's a kit of, of tools, essentially, that are going to help you with this deployment. And the MDT is a graphical interface that's going to help you keep everything organized. Now, with, uh, with these two things, they're both free you can achieve what they call a light touch installation or LTI, okay? Light touch installation essentially means that you're gonna, um, you're gonna start a deployment uh, over the network to a machine and when you go through that process of making this deployment occur, um, you're still gonna have to put your hands on the computers a little bit. Um, it's not gonna automate every little process for you, okay? Um, it's it's essentially going to require you to start each machine and um, run a command to either capture an image or deploy an image. It's going to be very quick. It's not going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot faster than running around with 50 DVDs or flash drives in your hand or whatever, but you are still going to have to put your hands on each computer. Okay, That's why they call it a light touch installation. Now, you can utilize what's called the MDT as well as Endpoint Configuration Manager. You might be familiar with uh, SCCM. You might have heard of that over the years. Um, System uh, Center Configuration Manager. Now it did get a name change to Endpoint Configuration Manager, but um, it's, a, it's a product that you can purchase and you can license. It's a very powerful product and with that you can automate the entire process and you can achieve what is known as a zero touch installation which basically means that you could you can have this piece of uh, the server software that's going to um, communicate with your machines and automate the process of capturing images and deploying images okay now I'm not gonna get into a lot of depth on that right now just understand that basic idea uh, let's keep it simple in this particular video um, that's the idea it's gonna automate the whole process and you can achieve what they call ZTI or zero touch installation okay the next is Windows Autopilot. Now, if you want to say, okay, there's a there's a new way of doing things. This is the newer way of doing things, Autopilot. And it isn't all that new. It's been out for years now, but it's new to a lot of people. Whereas the imaging idea has been around since the 1990s. Uh, Autopilot, you know, has has just been around a few years. So it's a it's a newer idea. And the 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 idea of autopilot, you're gonna use in the Microsoft world, you use what's called Intune. Intune is Microsoft's MDM, MAM product. That's mobile device management, mobile application management product. It's a cloud-based product. And basically what happens is you can buy new machines and 
you can register what is known as a device ID for each of those machines. I'm not getting into the details of all that in this video, but basically you register the device IDs of these machines. And as long as these machines, when they boot up um, and have an internet connection, they can communicate with Intune in the cloud and they'll automatically do this, which is really neat. And, uh, and Intune can configure these machines. Now, if you think about one of the things you hate about uh, new machines, you go out and buy new machines that already have Windows installed and Windows comes with all this crappy software that you don't want that's installed through the vendor, like maybe you purchased a bunch of computers from Dell or, or HP or somebody like that, well you've, you've bought all this software, you bought all these computers with this software you don't want, uh, Windows Autopilot can actually wipe all that crappy software away, you can get rid of it, and um, it will reconfigure everything for you. Now Autopilot is an Intune based system. You do have to have a license for Intune. On the flip side, there is a, a thing called provisioning packages. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. That uh, is similar to Autopilot that doesn't cost any money. But Autopilot is a, a, a licensed based thing. Good news is if you get a lot of the Microsoft 365 licenses, you automatically get it. So it's it's just included as a license that you can get. Um, you're not paying any extra money. So if you really want to know what Microsoft wants you to really focus on these days, it's Autopilot. That's the, the process. The, the imaging system is an older idea. It's a great concept, um, but Autopilot doesn't require you to blow away machines and, and redeploy anything. Autopilot lets you reconfigure things or what they call reprovision things, as opposed to blowing something away and um, and re you know redoing it. Um, so that's what Autopilot is in a nutshell. I'm not going to get into a lot more depth in this video. Uh, then you have an in-place upgrade. In-place upgrade is a real simple idea. You have an older version of Windows and you upgrade to the new version of Windows. Okay. Um, and the great thing about doing an in-place upgrade is if you do an in-place upgrade, you don't have to reinstall any kind of software or any of that. The software will go with you. The downside of doing an in-place upgrade is sometimes if you have a, uh, an older operating system that has some software that's sort of corrupted and has problems, when you do that in-place upgrade to the new version of Windows, um, that, that corrupted software goes into that new version. So the downside of that is you may have problems that come uh, from the old operating system to the new operating system. All right, let's talk about Windows ADK a little bit more. So I was telling you that Windows ADK is sort of like a, a it's a toolkit, right? It's free. You download it off Microsoft's website. It gives you all these various tools that will assist you with uh, dealing with Windows uh, deployments, all right? So the first thing is the application compatibility toolkit. This is called ACT. And right now, and, and really this is all you need to focus on, you don't have to be an expert on every one of these, but you need to know just a little bit about each one. And that's what we're looking at in this video, okay? So the, uh, the Application Compatibility Toolkit is, uh, again, it comes with Windows ADK, it's free, you install that. And the neat thing about it is it has the ability, um, you install it on a computer in your environment, and you can tell it to scan other computers in your environment and it will inventory what software is on those computers and tell you if there's going to be any incompatibility issues. So for example, let's say you're running an older version of Windows and you're going to be going into a newer version of Windows and um, you're worried about compatibility problems. Maybe you have some older software that you bought like 10 years ago. And this is something we all run into in IT probably. Uh, as a consultant, I can tell you that I've ran into this so many times where you know I come into somewhere and, uh, to do a job and, and what happens is you get a company that they bought software 10 years ago and they spent a lot of money on the licensing for it. They don't want to let go of it. Um, because they spent all that money and so basically what ends up happening is they want to hold on to it uh, for 10 years or 15 years and so now you got this old software that was meant for a very old version of Windows and they're wanting to run it on this new version of Windows. Maybe it runs on the current version it's on but then you've got a new version of Windows that just came out and you need it to run on that new version. Well ACT, the great thing about it is it can download this database of um, what are called patches and shims and um, it can scan your network and tell you if any of these, uh, any of your software is incompatible. And then it could potentially allow you to install these little patches or shims, uh, these little pieces of software that could fix compatibility problems. 
Um, so it'll scan, it'll tell you, hey, you're, you got this piece of software that's not compatible with the new version of Windows. So if you do deploy the new version of Windows, it's not going to work. However, it might have a patch that you can deploy that'll fix that. So then you have User State Migration Tool, or USMT. Okay, So User State Migration Tool is it's actually a command line tool that has two little um, programs in it that are usually used. One is called Scan State, one is called Load State. And this is used for migration. So what's a migration? The idea would be you have a user who is going to be, um, maybe they uh, have an old computer, it's out of date, it's outdated, and they're going to be getting a new computer. And of course, what's that user going to stress about? The user is going to be worried about all their stuff, right? All, all of my data is on this old computer and I want to move over to the new computer. So by doing what's called a scan state, it will back up all of their data and you can back it up wherever you want. You can back it up to a flash drive or back it up across the network. Uh, and then you can do a load state to the new computer and it'll restore everything and it'll put it all right back uh, as closely as it possibly can to the way it was on that old uh, on the old computer to be on the new computer. And that, so you could even be going from an older operating system to a newer operating system and it should be able to sort of match up where things should go on the computer. That's the idea of user state migration tool. Then you have DISM, Deployment Imaging Servicing and Management. So we talked about what a, a light touch deployment, a light touch installation, all that is. DISM is, the, is a command line tool that can capture images on a hard drive. So it can capture all the data, store it into what's called a WIM file, which is a Windows imaging file. And then you can deploy that out to uh, a new computer. So when we talk about the Windows ADK, we talk about MDT and all that. DISM is a tool that does the capturing all right, of images and deployment of images. Then you have Volume Activation Management Tool, VAMPED. Um, volume Activation Management Tool is a tool that will scan all the computers in your network and tell you which computers are activated and which computers are not activated. Uh, so it's a great way just to get a, a, an inventory of machines in your environment to make sure that all the machines are activated. You can actually even activate machines remotely using that tool. Then you have ICD, the uh, Imaging Configuration Designer. Um, uh, image Configuration Designer is what we use to build what are called provisioning packages. So I was talking about Autopilot a little earlier. Autopilot is a cloud-based solution that uh, it, it usually you're going to use Intune in the Microsoft world to use it. And the idea is and if you get a, a new computer, instead of blowing away the machine and putting a new image on it, you can reconfigure the machine. Even if you buy a new computer and it's got a bunch of old software on it or a bunch of uh, software that's been put on it from somebody like Dell or HP, uh, you can use these little things called provisioning packages and run. Uh, you can build these provisioning packages. And they're basically just little files that have everything in it that you want to change about a computer, including you can tell Windows to just basically wipe off all software that's not native to Windows. In other words, if Dell or HP has put a bunch of crap software on the computer you don't want, it'll just wipe it off. And then you can also tell it, hey, I want to install this piece of software. Hey, I want you to uh, reconfigure the settings on Windows to do certain features or have certain features turned on or off. And it'll do that. That's uh, what a provisioning package will do. Same thing Autopilot Intune can do, but uh, ICD is free. It doesn't cost anything. Now, the downside of that is it's an on-premise based solution. So it doesn't, you know, the great thing about Autopilot is the computers could be traveling. They could be anywhere in the world and they could be reconfigured. With, with uh, Imaging Configuration Designer, you do have to have network connectivity in an on-premise environment. And that kind of gives you an idea in a nutshell. Again, that's all I'm doing in this video is just giving you some information to uh, is an overview here, all right? So we're not looking in any depth on these right now. Then you have UEV, User Experience Virtualization. Um, what this is is a way of storing, so Microsoft had roaming profiles back in the day. Roaming profiles allowed a user to have all of their, uh, this person's desktop settings, shortcuts, screensaver, wallpaper, and when they jump from one Windows machine to another on the network, if they moved around, all that would follow them. Well, roaming profiles was not a very efficient way to do it. So user experience virtualization is a newer way to do things where um, it, it's more efficient than roaming profiles. But I will tell you a little secret about that. They've kind of deprecated this now. Uh, they still kind of want you to know what it is, but ultimately they've moved to a better way of doing it and a cloud way of doing it um, with the help of OneDrive that Microsoft pushes right now. They've uh, 
they've got some better ways of storing user information than than uh, doing it on the network. Of course, everything they're trying to really push the cloud stuff, and so that's what you really want to focus on. So UEV is kind of dying out, but it is still available. Then you have AppV, application virtualization. AppV, in a nutshell, is a way of packaging up apps into a single file and making that app available across the network. So imagine if you could take a, a program of some kind, okay, like let's say you've got um, a PDF editing software of some kind. You could, uh, like Foxit or something, you could uh, package up that Foxit PDF writing software and um, you could store it on a server. Now this would mean that a user would not have to have that software installed on their computer. They could have a shortcut put on their desktop to where when they open that shortcut it actually remotes into that package that's running on a server. It pulls it up into memory on the machine and the person uses it remotely. All right. Now that just gives you a basic idea of, of AppV. Another thing that's great about AppV is because the software is stored in one file, the, the file can be encrypted and it can be digitally signed, which means there's no way for a virus or anything like that to infect that file without, it, uh, without the operating system knowing and making the file um, unusable at that point. All right, this is sort of a similar concept to how we have, why our phones and tablets and things like that are so secure. Okay, then you got performance and assessment tools. Those are uh, tools that allow us to scan computers for checking performance and doing assessment tests and things like that. It's good too if you're going to do upgrades, it's going to tell you if there's going to be any hardware issues, um, making sure that. Uh, you know, there's not going to be any hardware issues if you're doing the upgrade. So then you have Windows PE, that's the pre-installation environment. Microsoft has made this available as a separate download now, so it doesn't necessarily have to be part of the Windows ADK anymore. But Windows PE is the pre-installation environment. So when you're going to do an image, if you're going to capture an image or deploy an image, you're going to run DISM. Windows PE is a um, very, very lightweight command line version of Windows. It'll fit on a flash drive, it'll fit on a CD, it'll fit on a DVD. Um, it can be it can run across the network when you're doing uh, imaging, but basically, uh, and if you know what Pixie is, the pre-boot execution environment where a computer can boot up across the network with nothing on it, um, PE can be downloaded into memory, and basically uh, you can use DISM, the command called DISM, Deployment Imaging Servicing Management, to capture a Windows image or deploy a Windows image. Now again, remember, all I'm doing in this video is just giving you some basic knowledge here. I'm not going into a lot of depth here, so you might still not quite understand that. That's okay. All right. All right, and then finally, just to overview the MDT a little deeper. Remember, MDT, uh, Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, this is the analogy I use for that is like if you were a carpenter, you would have a, a workbench, right? In fact, you'll notice on the screen there it says Deployment Workbench. This is a free graphical tool that Microsoft provides that helps you organize deployments and manage deployments. So that's what it's all about. Like you'll see on the screen there that it mentions applications, it mentions operating systems, it mentions out-of-box drivers, packages, task sequences, uh, monitoring. So you know you, you can in, you can have applications that you want to deploy with your image, you can have operating systems, you have drivers that you want to include packages. Uh, uh, this gets into, um, you know, dealing with uh, the pr uh, provisioning packages I mentioned. You have task sequences. Task sequences are little uh, files that help automate the process of imaging. All right. Um, but that's what the MDT is. It's the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. It's free. It's a workbench. It's a graphical tool to assist you in, uh, in working with the imaging process. All right. Okay. So I hope this gives you a good overview of these deployment tools to help you understand and kind of visualize. Again, I wasn't doing any hands-on here, though I will do tons and tons of hands-on in the course here, but I wanted you to get just a, a little bit of an understanding of these various tools, and hopefully um, I've achieved that in this video. I now want to get into understanding the concepts of uh, utilizing a migration versus rebuilding. All right, so I want to just kind of draw this out and help you uh, visualize this. So let me just move this up here. So to start with, let's talk about migration. All right, in in regards to a migration, um, 
you kind of want to look at it from the standpoint there, there's two ways of looking at it. In fact, Microsoft has a tool called the User State Migration Tool that's part of the Windows ADK that, uh, that's free that'll help you with a migration. And the idea of migration is basically backing up everything uh, somewhere, like on a user's machine, and then being able to restore that information uh, to a new operating system perhaps that you're installing. So you got an old version of Windows maybe, you're gonna put a new version of Windows on there. Um, so let's say we've got uh, this computer here and we've got an older version of Windows on there. Okay, so we'll say old Windows. All right, uh, it could be that this is, it could be that this is a laptop, you know, or it could be a desktop, either way. And you've got an old version of Windows on there and the user's got all of their stuff or what we call the user state, right? Now the user state is all of your users' documents, desktop settings, shortcuts, screensaver, wallpaper, whatever. All of that stuff is here. Their email, all of that stuff is on this machine on their old version of Windows. Now, um, first, you can do, you kind of have to look at it from this standpoint. Is the user getting a new machine or are you just doing a new operating system? All right, that's the question. Now, if you're doing a new operating system, perhaps you could just do in what's called an in-place upgrade. An in-place upgrade is just an upgrade to the newer operating system. Now, there's a catch to that. Then the catch to that is, what if you got a lot of problems with this Windows? What if there's a lot of issues? Um, maybe uh, you've got some corrupted files and things like that. And if you upgrade to the new version of Windows, the corrupted files maybe that are involved in the applications that are on the machine will make their way into the new operating system. So we, maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we don't want to do an upgrade. So we've chosen to do a migration. Okay. Um, so with that, um, you can, if you decided you wanted to, you could just get rid of the old version of Windows that's here and migrate to the new uh, version of Windows that's here. All right. Um, now, the great thing about that is I can retain my user's information if I want. All right. If I want to retain my user's data, I can totally do that. Their user state, all of their data, all of their settings and all that. I can back all that up, blow away the machine that's there, blow away the operating system that's there, and then put a new operating system on there if I want. And then I can restore that data uh, back to uh, what's on the machine. Now keep in mind that when you do a migration, you will still have to reinstall their applications. It doesn't back up their applications, but it does back up their application settings. It does back up their data and all of that stuff. All right. Um, so I have that ability. Now there's a couple of different ways of looking at migrate. You have what's called a side by side migration and a wipe and load migration. Now, if you're going to keep this uh, older machine, you're not going to be getting a new machine, you're just going to keep the older machine and put a new version of Windows on there, um, then that would be known as a wipe and load migration. Uh, wipe and load, wipe and load, all right. Um, so the idea would be you're just going to be backing up the user's data, so we'll back up state this is called in user state migration terms, we call this a scan state. There's actually a, an executable called scanState.exe that, that you get with the USMT user state migration tool, which comes with Windows ADK, Windows Assessment and Deployment Toolkit, which again is free. Uh, you download it off Microsoft's website, but I'm not getting into doing that right now. I'm just trying to help you understand these concepts first here. Um, but we back up the state, right? Uh, and then at that point, we wipe away the old operating system. So whatever the operating system is, we blow it away. And by the way, when you back up the user state, you can choose where to back it up to. If you want to back up the user state to a flash drive, you want to back it up to a, across the network to a server, um, you can totally do that. Uh, external hard drive, whatever it may be, you're just going to back up the user state. You use this scan state tool to do that, and you wipe away the old operating system. All right, uh, at that point, you would install the new operating system. So you put new version of Windows on there, and at that point, you um, restore 
the state. And that would be what we call a load state. All right, it's called a load state. So you back up the state using a scan state, wipe away the old operating system, install the new operating system, and then restore state. So that is what we call a wipe and load uh, migration. Now, you've also got what is called a side-by-side -side migration. And so the idea there is, and I'm just going to cheat and copy this right here. All right. So you got an old computer. Um, so we'll say this is a old PC. All right. And then you've got a new PC. All right. So this is going to be our new PC over here. Um, and basically what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to migrate use this little arrow here you're going to migrate the user state over to this new machine okay so you can basically set up the new OS so I set up the new OS over here so we'll say new windows installed over here right uh, and then at that point I can I can run, I can back up state using scan state. And that, of course, is going to be done on old PC, right? And then at that point, you can do a um, restore state, load state right on the new PC all right and so that that's the idea and of course you could have done this step here before you did that step it really doesn't matter um, main thing is before you do this step here you do have to have the new operating system set up on that other machine so hopefully you can see why that's called a side-by-side -side migration because you're actually gonna keep the old computer in place um, as you do that migration. Now the benefit too, you're getting, the person is getting a new computer, so new hardware and all that. And one of the main reasons for doing that is the user's getting new hardware, right? So you're getting a new computer, a new operating system, but their big concern is what about all of my data? Is my data gonna make it over there to me? Um, you know, do this new machine, what am I gonna do? Well, with the help of this strategy here, you are uh, basically able to leave that old computer into you can leave it going in fact actually just migrate everything over and then you just shut it down and the great thing about it is if things don't work as well as you plan on this new machine you still have the old machine as a backup for a while and then you can decommission this old machine after a while once everything is of course going smoothly on this new machine okay so that is the idea of you know, going through this process of migration and um, the concept of rebuild. So what is rebuilding? Rebuilding is uh, having to rebuild uh, everything from scratch. The, the big thing about having this migration is you backed everything up. Now, of course, if a user was to lose their machine, let's say the machine got corrupted, you lost the hard drive, the hard drive died, nothing was backed up. Sadly, you would have to rebuild everything from the ground up. You'd have to you know, set up a new operating system and the user would have lost all their data. Now there's ways around that, and I'm not getting into the, all the details in this video, but um, Microsoft has some cloud solutions like OneDrive and all of that for backing up users' data and having all their data backed up to the cloud. It's a wonderful thing because you could literally lose your whole hard drive and you're still in business. I've, I've actually experienced that before. I, I use the cloud-based solutions for, for backing up. And um, now granted, I, I use, in my case, this happened with Dropbox for me because I, I was using Dropbox before OneDrive ever came out. But I had that situation happen on one of my laptops where I literally just had a hard drive that just died. It just died. There was not really much of a recovery. I mean, short of maybe hiring a forensics expert to try to recover some of my data, there's not anything I could have done. That hard drive was dead. But I had all of my critical information being synced to Dropbox. Now, it's the same idea with OneDrive, right? 
Um, so if I did have a process, so in my case, I went out and I got a new hard drive and all that, and I had to rebuild. I had to put you know the new operating system on there and all that, but everything was installed in the cloud, so I was able to do a restore. So that, that cloud-based solution is a great way to protect you from having to rebuild. But the idea of a migration is backing everything up, having that back up, and then when I'm now ready to um, you know, do a restore, I can do a restore. And you're going to use the user state migration tool. And that's really the concepts that I need you to understand right now. Just understand what a wipe and load migration is versus a side-by-side -side migration. And uh, if you've got that down, then that's all I really need you to get down in this, um, in this video. I now like to talk about uh, some of the strategies involving imaging and provisioning uh, in the Microsoft environment. Now, it's important to have a good visualization of how all this works, and this drawing is going to hopefully help you with uh, grasping those concepts. Um, so to start with, let's talk about traditional imaging concepts first, and then we'll, we'll discuss provisioning. Uh, in traditional imaging, the idea of this is generally um, you would kind of start out with setting up what is called an imaging server. Okay, so in the Windows world, we would uh, we would basically set up a server on premise most of the time. Um, you know, this could be you know the the latest version of server it could actually go all the way back to Windows. Um, 2008 Windows Server 2008 in order to do this so it doesn't you know, doesn't necessarily have to be a new version but it does need to be a version of server and then what you do on that server is you install something called WDS WDS is Windows Deployment Services and I'll just kind of put that right here for you so you've got the uh, the acronym Windows Deployment Services is uh, one of the roles and features that you can install on your uh, Windows servers okay so we installed WDS, all right, and with WDS you get uh, what's called PIXI, P-X-E, which stands for Preboot Execution Environment. I'll put that right here. If you're not familiar with PIXI, PIXI is a um, capability that allows a machine to event to essentially be um, booted off the network. So what's great about it is you literally could have nothing on a computer and if there's a Pixie service running on your network this computer could boot off the network, get an IP address from like a DHCP server and all of that and it could communicate in regards to the server. So this is what Pixie is uh, all about, preboot execution environment. Okay. Um, the next thing that I would want to install on this uh, server would be the Windows ADK, the Windows Assessment and Deployment Toolkit, which is going to give me, that's kind of a big acronym, let's see if we can fit it all in here, but WADK, Windows Assessment and Deployment Toolkit. Again, it's just a free series of tools you can install, free series of tools you can download and install on a machine. You can actually install that on client machines as well, but in this case, uh, we put it on a server. And it's gonna give me a, a series of tools like DISM, Deployment Imaging Servicing Management. I'm gonna uh, have access to Windows PE, the Windows pre-installation uh, pre environment. You can download and have that with it. Um, and then also, I'm gonna want MDT, Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, which is the graphical tool that sort of helps me oversee imaging. Um, now granted you could also put that on a different computer but most people like to put it right there on the server okay so this server is going to have a lot of uh, various tools on it that uh, are various services and tools on it that are going to assist me with imaging and so this would be called our imaging uh, service alright or in imaging server from there what I would do is let's say I've got I mean, I need to set up like 50 machines to be identical. Maybe uh, imagine this scenario. Imagine your your company's hiring a big sales force, um, you know, to to help market products. Maybe your company's doing really well, and but they but they know they need more salespeople, so they hire a big sales force. So you have uh, you have to set up sales machines. So the starting point for this usually is you would have a Windows machine. Okay, so you, you have Windows Client Machine, Windows Client, 
and this would be what we call a reference machine okay reference PC so this would be a machine that has all the software on it so you would you would set it up and configure it exactly the way you need it all to be set up so I'd take a version of Windows I would install everything on it configure it the way I want to configure it install the applications on it everything like office and all of that would be on there and this would be my reference machine okay um, and maybe this is going to be you kind of have to think about like in sales for example you have multiple salespeople uh, multiple sales uh, sub departments so there maybe this is for what we call inside sales people um, and we have like an outside sales and if again if you if you know the business world you may know there's different various subcategories of sales maybe this is geared towards inside sales people you'll see why I'm doing it this way here in just a second okay so from there now that I've, I've got my reference computer what I want to do is capture this as an image so what we're gonna do we would we would boot this computer up to capture the image now in order to do that we need to boot it into what is called Windows PE Windows P. So to capture an image, we need to boot this into Windows PE. All right. So the first thing also to be aware of is that um, this is a, and I just noticed that I've typoed reference PC. So let's just fix that real quick here. All right. Um, with with a with Windows, one thing to be aware of is that all versions of Windows that are installed those are sometimes referred to as online images alright so any Windows operating system where the operating system is installed on the computer is called an online image now you might say well, what if I shut that computer off and it's off it's still considered an online image and I'm gonna explain what an offline image is in just a second okay so any version of Windows Windows that's installed is called an online image so what you're trying to do is capture this online image and it'll be stored in a file which is an offline image alright but I'll, I'll get to that more in a minute so to capture an image I need to be booted into Windows PE all right. Now, to do that, there's various ways you can have Windows PE. Windows PE is a lightweight version of Windows. It's not graphical. It's all command line. And you can get into Windows PE by booting off Pixie or by a DVD with it on it, a CD, or a USB drive that's got it on it. So as you can see, there are various ways that you can have something that has um, Windows PE on it. Pixie's probably the easiest way to do it. You got this server that's got the Pixie service running on. As long as they're on the same network, you can tell this computer to boot off the network. It'll see Pixie. It'll download Windows PE automatically into memory as long as it's been uh, you've set all this up on this server. Okay. So from there, once that's done, I can run I can run dism.exe to capture the image. So dism.exe is a command line tool that's inside the, uh, the Windows PE environment that's going to let me basically capture this image. All right. And then what will happen is you store that image inside of an image file. Okay. Now in this case, we'll just call this image file sales.wim. Now that, what you see there, that is what we call an offline image okay so when it's captured in a file it's called an offline image alright now here's what's really neat about it the image file can actually contain more than one image and you have to name the image inside the file so I would call this image inside sales and it'll actually have a number associated with it called an index number in this case index one the very first image inside of an image file is called index one now you may say okay well wait a minute you said it can be you're only storing one image what if you wanted to store multiple well that's check this out where do you get into a situation like this where uh, we have another reference computer but instead of this being inside sales this reference computer is configured slightly different and this will be called outside sales okay and you're going to capture that image the same way except this time you're going to tell it to store it in this file but it'll be called outside sales so as you can see you've actually got two images stored inside the same image file and what's really neat about that too is any files that are inside that uh, sales.wim file uh, that are the exact same file 
they don't have to have multiple copies. So the, the image itself can be kind of compressed down. You may say, well, does it look at the names of the files? No, it actually doesn't look at the name. It, it looks at the binary of the file. The binary of the file is the same. It doesn't have to reuse the, the same files. All right. So what you see here, this is an example of light uh, touch installation. All right, LTI, light touch installation. It's traditional. It's the, the way that um, we have been doing it now for years and years and years. This, uh, this came out, the, doing imaging, of course, came out in the 1990s, but this particular method of imaging became available in the year 2008 when Windows Server 2008 became available. Okay, before 2008, they had something else called RIS, Remote Installation Services, but this is how it's been ever since Server 2008 came out. This is a traditional way of doing a light touch installation. Now, why is it a light touch installation? Because I still have to put my hands on the computer. Now, I still had to put my hands on these computers to capture the image, and then also you gotta put your hands on the computer when you're deploying uh, an image as well. So imagine a scenario where I've got, let's say that these machines right here are my uh, target machines or destination computers, okay? Um, so we'll say we have 50 new computers and uh, these are, again, these are our destination, destination PCs, okay? So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna deploy the image you're going to essentially deploy the image about the exact same way that you capture the image. Let me move these uh, acronyms just a little bit out of the way here. All right. Um, so you're going to use you're going to use deploy image, but you're going to be using Win WinPE and Dizzle. So it's basically the same exact thing that you did over here, but there is a instead of a um, capture command, you'll have a different command that'll be used for uh, deploying this image. All right, it's called apply. They, we, most everybody uses the word deploy, but it's actually called applying an image uh, using DISM. So then you can boot these machines up, tell them to boot off Windows PE by basically triggering Pixie, which is like hit F, use, a lot of times it's like F12 as the computer's booting, um, but it does depend on the type of computer you're using and it will trigger to boot off the network. Now again, all of this is a light touch installation, LTI, because you're still having to put your hands on the computer. Now there is also what we call zero touch installation. To do a zero touch installation, you have to have another special server. That special server is called Microsoft Configuration Manager. All right, MCM or Microsoft Config Manager. Oops, let me fix that Microsoft and then I'll put config manager in there all right now this this server has had various names over the years um, and its name keeps changing it used to be back in the 90s it was called an SMS server system management services and then in the 2000s it became uh, SCCM um, system center configuration manager then in uh, uh, the beginning of what was it 2020 I believe they changed it to Microsoft uh, Endpoint Configuration Manager and now they just call it Microsoft Config Manager um, which of course is still doing endpoint management which is endpoints being your clients and all that so the great thing about um, Config Manager is it has these task sequences that are used for automation so you can automate things now, granted, the MDT, the Microsoft Deployment um, Tool, which is the workbench, has some task sequences as well, but it doesn't have all the task sequences needed for uh, doing full automation. So the thing about uh, Config Manager is it can communicate with your various devices, and it can tell your various devices what to do. It can tell devices to get captured, and it can tell devices to get deployed and it can tell devices it can tell uh, the server information of, that needs to happen as well this is what makes config manager special is the fact that it can do that it can perform a zero touch uh, installation and all that so it can do all this automation that's what makes this so uh, powerful that, that's what makes this so good and that is what's going to give you a zero touch uh, deployment. So with this, with Config Manager, 
you get the ability to support ZTI. Um, now, I'll also tell you that Config Manager is not free. It's a licensed product. So you, you do have to have a licensed version. You have to have a licensed Config Manager. Whereas everything else you saw before I put this Config Manager on the screen is free. You know, you, you have to have licensed Windows, obviously, and licensed server. But as far as all the tools go, it's all free. Okay. Now, everything you just saw there is the way we have done things now um, since the year 2008, okay? There's not really any anything that has changed since the year 2008 that you just saw on the screen. And I'll be honest with you, this is now, you might be just learning this for the first time and might be thinking, oh, this is a, a great solution for our company and all that, but let me be honest, this is not the direction Microsoft wants to go anymore. Um, and, and the days are numbered, there'll, there'll be a day, it could be 10, 15, 20 years down the road, I don't know when it'll be where they're going to probably stop supporting the older imaging solution. What Microsoft is wanting to do now is called provisioning. So this is imaging, what you just saw. This helps you visualize it. And yes, you do need to understand just the concepts here. But just know this is, this is the old way to do it, believe it or not. And you might still be doing it in your company, and there's nothing wrong with that because it still has its place in the world. But I can tell you that Microsoft is really trying to, to push everybody into the newer solutions. What are the newer solutions? The newer solutions is provisioning. All right, now let's go down to this other little drawing, and this is uh, my little domain cloud drawing. And um, the idea here is, um, let's say we have a domain, we have this Microsoft domain here, in my case it's examlabpractice.com, and you have Azure, right? Microsoft Azure, Microsoft 365 services and all that running out in the cloud. Um, now there's two ways of doing provisioning. Um, the first way I'll show you is the way they really want you to do it, which is to use Intune. Intune has a feature called Autopilot, all right? And I'm not getting into all the details here. This is giving you a, this is the planning phase. This is visual, visualizing and understanding. But Autopilot is a provisioning solution. With Autopilot, what I can basically do is I can buy new computers. Let's take, uh, let me just get rid of this for just a second. All right. So I can buy new computers. And let's say that this little box, these little boxes right here, this is going to represent uh, new computers, new PCs, okay? And I can register this, I can learn what these machines, device IDs are, okay? Um, a device ID is a unique identifier. It's based on the, the motherboard serial number and all that on these machines, but I'm not going to get into too many details on that. But I can discover this thing called the device ID, and I can register the device IDs of these new machines, you could learn this from your uh, your provider if you're buying this from Dell or HP or whoever. And what's neat about it, you can register the device IDs into, into what's called Intune here, Microsoft Intune in the cloud, all right? And you can create these things called configuration profiles. Now what happens is you buy these new computers, you plug them in as long as they have an internet connection. And they've already got a copy of Windows. You know, usually when you buy a a, a computer from Dell or HP or whoever, it's already got Windows installed on it, right? So basically you plug it in, it's got Windows on, as long as there's an internet connection, it'll boot up across the internet automatically and communicate with Intune, the Intune service on the internet. And, it, and because you've registered the device IDs of these machines with your Intune service, it knows that these devices belong to you. And if you configure this thing called a device configuration profile, all right, it'll configure the out-of-box experience and all that, and Intune can deploy software down to these devices as well as reconfigure, or what they like to say, not reconfigure, they like to say reprovision these machines. Okay, that means that if there's any software on these machines you don't like, Intune Autopilot can have that stripped off. And then any software that needs to be installed on there, it can all be deployed. It can deploy policies, all of that down to these new machines. You can even do that without even having a Microsoft domain. In my drawing, I've got a domain here, but I literally could have no domain and I could do all of this. And it doesn't involve you having to blow away the hard drive and redo what's on there. Okay, um, That's the idea. 
Whereas if you get into imaging, you are, you know, essentially blowing away hard drives and redoing things. So this is the newer solution. Now, another way of doing provisioning is not involving the cloud at all, okay? You can actually install the Windows ADK, this little thing right here, can be installed on a computer in my domain, and I can do what's called provisioning packages. I can set up a server with, let me just get rid of this for right now. I could set up a server. Technically, it doesn't even have to be a server, to be honest with you. It could be a, a, a client operating system that you set this up on, but I can set up a server with um, what are called provisioning packages, all right? And that's these little files, these little these little files, okay, that, let's put little writing so it looks like little, little files here. These little files that can tell a computer to remove software that they don't need and that can be, in, and also you can tell a machine to get its software reconfigured. So essentially it can do the same thing as Intune, but it's an on-premise solution, all right? So from there, I could get these new machines and I could use provisioning packages to tell these machines to all get reconfigured without having to use Intune. Now there's a catch to all this. One of the beautiful things about Intune is that machines can travel. They could be anywhere in the world and Intune can manage them. With the provisioning package solution, the machines basically generally have to be on-premise. They've got to have connectivity with the server somehow. Uh, it, it, you know, technically it could be done over a VPN or something like that, but it's a lot harder to manage machines with provisioning packages this way than it would be to use Intune. Intune is Microsoft's main solution now for dealing with MDM, MAM. So if you really want to know the direction Microsoft really wants everybody to go, it's going to be the Intune route. But the provisioning package route is another solution that doesn't really cost anything. Okay, it's, it's free. You download Windows ADK you're going to get the software needed to set up provisioning packages. So again, what's the major difference from imaging versus provisioning? Imaging involves the traditional way of capturing an image, uh, blowing away the hard drive of a computer, and then deploying that image down, whereas provisioning is, doesn't involve you having to, to blow anything away. You're just taking what's already there, whatever Windows copy that's there, and you're redoing it uh, the way you want it to be done. Okay. All right, so hopefully now you have a, a grasp on uh, visualizing the differences between imaging and provisioning. I'd now like to introduce you to Microsoft Intune. Now, if you're not familiar with Intune, Intune has been a product that Microsoft came out with a few years ago that they are heavily pushing. In fact, they, um, they've really, really started pushing this hard uh, so that it can be a solution that you can use for managing all your devices, both on-premise as well as off-premise. So uh, devices that travel, devices that are on-premise, even devices that are hosted in the cloud can be uh, managed by Intune. In other words, virtual devices and all of that uh, is all going to be uh, something you can manage through the cloud. Now, first thing to know here is that Intune is Microsoft's MDM, MAM solution. What does that mean? Well, MDM is mobile device management, MAM is mobile application management, and uh, this all came about years ago uh, when the smartphone became popular. So as smartphones became popular, um, the companies needed a way to manage those devices. Uh, that, that are obviously people are carrying around with them. It's kind of a scary thing when you think about the fact that a, a user could be using their smartphone to browse some of the sketchiest places on the internet, and then five seconds later, they could be checking their work email and accessing work documents from that same phone. Um, so the industry needed a solution for this. So what ended up happening was an organization called the OMA, the uh, uh, OMA, the Open Mobile Alliance, which is made up of a bunch of the different cellular companies, they developed a, a, a standard, and that standard is called MDM. Microsoft is not the only organization to have an MDM product, but they're the only one we care about in this particular course, right, since we're here to learn about Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft's product, MDM product, is Intune, and it is a cloud-based solution that allows you to enroll devices and manage those devices. Now, of course, Intune did kind of start out focusing just on mobile devices like 
uh, smartphones, but now all Microsoft software uh, is uh, manageable with the utilization of Intune. So you could be using a, a desktop work, uh, workstation, you could be using a Surface tablet, you could be using a smartphone, it could be Apple, it could be Android, they're now st starting to support Linux um, and Mac OS and all of that can all be managed through Intune. And what's great about it is it doesn't rely on on-premise services. The device could travel anywhere in the world. As long as it's got an internet connection, it can be managed. Now, again, if you just go out to Google or Bing and just search the words, what are Intune? Uh, what is Intune? You'll come across this article here, Microsoft Intune. They tell you sec uh, securely manages identities, apps, and devices. So it's a method for allowing devices to be enrolled, those devices can be uh, looked at as what apps are on them, inventoried, monitored, and you can then provide remote services against those devices, such as the ability to deploy settings to those devices, deploy apps to those devices, uh, make changes to the apps, make changes to the, to the uh, settings of the device. You can add security down to the device, and um, it gives you a lot of control. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, that's fine if it's a corporate owned device, but what if it's a, a personal owned device? Well, you are limited on what you can do if it's a personal device, um, unless they unless they enroll it, which if it gets enrolled in Intune and it's linked to Intune, at that point you can manage it. But if it's not, you can have uh, application restrictions that are placed on the apps that users install. So for example, if a user downloads Outlook, uh, and they start trying to check their work email, as soon as they authenticate using that work email account, then um, restrictions can be placed on Outlook while they're using it. Same for things like uh, Word and Excel and all of those things. So even if they don't enroll the device, you actually can have a measure of restrictions that are placed on it, okay? Um, so there's lots of, of capabilities and features that you get with this. You can manage it over the web. They tell you it integrates with other Microsoft services and apps. You get autopilot, which is a big deal. Um, the ability to, to do zero touch installation, or I'm sorry, zero touch provisioning uh, remotely, meaning uh, you can buy new, new computers, plug them in, and autopilot is going to be able to help manage that. I'm not going to get too deep into that in this particular video, but ultimately the amount of things you can do is is uh, crazy that they're starting to support and they're adding new features all the time uh, in the past on-premise devices mostly would be managed through gpos we're called gpos group policy objects and you can still do that in on-premise domain but um unfortunately gpos you know if a device leaves the network there those gpos those group policy objects can't really be applied unless there's connectivity with, uh, with Intune, you can apply a lot of the same policies that you applied with GPOs on-premise, and it doesn't matter where the device is. The device could be anywhere in the world and still uh, be managed. So let me show you how we can just jump right into uh, Intune. First thing you got to understand is that you could just start right here on portal.microsoft.com and click Show All, and then click right here where it says Endpoint Manager, or you can just go to endpoint.microsoft.com. Either way, you're going to end up in the same place. So here we are in the Microsoft Intune Admin Center. This is sort of the starting point. All right, you can see you start out here on home. You can have a little dashboard to kind of look at all the stuff going on in your environment. Um, you can click on all services and kind of see a list of different services that you've got involved in Intune. Um, you can click devices and you can see all the devices that have been linked to Intune and currently I have only one device that's linked to Intune. You can see it by platform, Windows, iOS, Mac OS, Android, Chrome OS, Linux. So those are your different platforms. And Microsoft, I do want to warn you, they change this interface almost every week. So don't be surprised if your screen might look a little different than mine. Um, but you can you can you have the ability to enroll devices, which I'm not getting too deep into right now, but this is where you would go. And there's you can see where it mentions autopilot. Um, which is one of the big things that it does. Uh, so lots and lots of capabilities here, getting into policies and updates that can be deployed out to your devices. Here's where apps gets managed, so you can deploy applications. Make uh, You can put restrictions on applications. You have what are called app protection policies. All right, endpoint security, so security capabilities that can be put in place. 
you have all these reports. You can see what users are um, given a, a license. The one thing you'll you'll want to be aware of is when you are working with uh, Intune, a user must have a license to be managed. They're in a user's device that they're going to be linking into. They have to have a license before they can do that. Um, so essentially, like here, if I look at my uh, user JC John Christopher here, John Christopher. Uh, if I click on licenses, I can see that I have a a license for Intune. Now, how do I know that? Because th because this right here, Enterprise Mobility Plus Security, gives you a license for Intune. All right. So if you click on that, you'll see we have Intune. All right. Not getting into the various plans right now, but um, there is various plans, and you can have uh, different features that get are available to you based on that. All right. But you can actually get uh, have an Intune license having this Enterprise Mobility Plus Security subscription. You could actually have an Intune license separately, or if you have one of the Microsoft 365 subscriptions, uh, like the E3 and the E5, you get Intune that way as well. All right, but um, ultimately, in order for a user's device to be managed by Intune, that'll be done by having a license. By default, um, Intune will, will manage up to five devices per user, but you can actually stretch that to 15. Um, there is a, a way to do that, which I'm not getting into right now. All right, so that's where your users are. You can also see your groups that are associated here. Now, this all ties back to Azure AD. So when you click on users and groups, you're really just looking at Azure AD, which is part of what they call Microsoft Intra, okay? Uh, and of course, there's tenant administration here, which ties back to Azure Active Directory. Not gonna get into a lot of depth there. And then there's also a troubleshooting and support area. So um, that just kind of gives you a high-level look and a, a quick introduction to what Intune is. All right, ultimately, Intune is incredibly powerful, and I'll tell you this is sort of the future. This is sort of where Microsoft is headed. So if you're wanting to be cutting edge, Intune is definitely something to be looking into. Here's the other good news. Intune is a whole lot less complicated than all the older technologies out there. And, and, and it's hard for me to say that. As somebody who has taught group policy objects and all that. I have taught that for 20 something years of my life, since, since the year 2000. And I was even teaching uh, NT policies back in the 90s. Uh, and as somebody who's done consulting work with group policies all these years, I've, I love group policies, but it's dated. Intune, managing devices through Intune is the way to go. That's the, that's the future, that's where Microsoft is wanting you to go. And of course, that's where you kind of want to put your, your focus in uh, in learning this stuff all right so hopefully this video has given you a little bit of a, a or a basic understanding of the purpose of Intune and now we're ready to move on as we move into understanding autopilot how to configure it, how to use it and all that I think it's very important that we can kind of visualize how this works all right uh, so in this drawing I want to help you visualize it I want you to help you help you kind of grasp the concepts before we actually look at it um, so the idea of autopilot is to get away from that traditional uh, idea of, of dealing with images in regards to our Microsoft devices. So you, in the traditional sense, if you went out and you bought a bunch of new uh, computers from an OEM like Dell or uh, HP or somebody like that, let's just use this little symbol here and I'll just kind of shrink it down to make some room. But let's say you had these new computers all right, new, we'll say new PCs, okay, and um, you, you've, you've bought these new machines. They've already got Windows installed, okay? They've already got an up-to-date version of Windows installed, all right? The, the problem is, is there is software on these machines we don't like, right? A lot of times you, you buy a new computer, it has a bunch of what they call grayware, uh, or adware, you know, advertising crap that we don't want. We want to get rid of this uh, this crappy software that we don't. The other thing we don't like about these new PCs is they're not configured the way we want. There are settings turned on that we don't want or settings turned off that we do want, right? So we need a solution that's going to allow us to reprovision this machine, reconfigure, reprovision this machine. Now, in the past, the way we did that is we set up a, a, a reference image, we captured that image, 
and then we blew away these machines and we deployed that and you know that worked and it was definitely faster than sitting down at each one of these machines one at a time and reinstalling but um but it still isn't as fast as just reconfiguring what's there i, I always use the analogy of it's sort of like let's say you go and you buy a new house um sitting on some land and you love the way the house is built. You love everything about the outside of the house. You love the way it looks inside, except you don't like any of the furnishings of the house. You don't like the furniture. You don't like the, the bathroom. You don't like the kitchen. Uh, you don't like any of that stuff. So instead of just you know pulling out all the furniture and the, the, the stuff you don't like that's on the inside of the house and replacing it, you know what you do? You hire a wrecking crew and you just knock the entire house over uh, and then you build a whole new house that looks exactly like the old house, and then you furnish it. Well, that's essentially what we're doing when we re-image a machine, okay? I know that's kind of funny and kind of extreme, but that's basically what we're, we're, we're blowing away what's there and replacing it with the same operating system most of the time, and it's just got different furnishings on it. So the idea of reprovisioning is not doing that, right? It's taking what's already there and reconfiguring it the way we want. There's two ways to do that. Uh, in the in the world we're living in, and that is using provisioning packages, which I'm not getting into in this video, or using autopilot, which is what I'm explaining in this video. So the idea of autopilot is it's a in in the Microsoft world, this of course is going to be managed by uh, Intune. So Intune is what's going to provide us this autopilot capability. Okay. So it is a feature that Intune is going to support for us. All right. So we have to have, we have to make sure we have Intune, all of that, and uh, the autopilot service is associated with Intune. All right. And then what we're going to do is make it where these machines, when these machines uh, get plugged in and turned on, they will, as long as there's an internet connection, they will just magically go to the internet and talk to Intune, and they know that they're associated to our uh, Intune. And then what happens is you have what is known as a um, out-of-box experience configuration profile that, that these machines get tied to, and what happens there is uh, the autopilot will, will automatically manage the settings, the out-of-box experience, the OOBE settings on the machine, and then Intune, it, these devices get enrolled into Intune, and then Intune can deploy software, it can get rid of the software we don't want. It can put software on there that we do want. It can reconfigure these machines any way we want, deploy policies. It could even You could even make these machines join the domain if you want. There's lots and lots and lots of stuff here you can do. Deploy updates. So it's incredibly powerful. Okay, but there's one missing ingredient here, something that you, you probably might think of here, and that is how do these machines know that they belong to me? So if you buy a bunch of new computers from Dell or HP or some other OEM, how do these machines know? Okay, well, one way you could do it is you could um, you could just link these machines, uh, assign licenses to the users that are going to sit at these machines, okay, and by setting up a license and linking autopilot to your users, the uh, when the users go to log on, using the out-of-box experience, then uh, Autopilot would take over because it would know, okay, well, these users are logging on and they have a license and each user is tied to Autopilot through a out-of-box experience profile. But that's not the preferred way to do it. What we want to make happen is that these machines just boot up and just magically it happens. No user is even sitting there. As long as we have an internet connection, we want it to uh, magically tie to this. So how's that going to happen? Well, the way that's going to happen is you have to know something called a device ID. Also, oops, a device ID. There we go. Also known as a hardware ID. Okay, hardware ID. De device ID, hardware ID. There's various names for it, but it's the same thing. All right, now what is that? It's basically a serial number that is associated to your motherboard of your computer. Now you might say, well, what if I've got a virtual machine? Well, if you didn't know this, every virtual machine gets a uh, unique, global unique identifier serial number. So even virtual machines have unique identifiers, okay? 
Um, and so what happens is you need to know what those identifiers are. All right, and if you know what those identifiers are, you can actually save the identifiers into what is known as a CSV file, a comma separated value file, and you can import that into autopilot. And that's how it's going to know. So when these machines boot up, they automatically go to the internet and announce to the Intune autopilot service, hey, I've got these device IDs. Intune matches it to our Intune service because we've already registered it. Okay. Now there's something else you can do that's really neat, and that is if you're working with an OEM, okay, like Dell or uh, HP, one of those companies, if you're going to order these computers off the internet from them, you can let them know that you are uh, going to use autopilot, and you can let them know what your domain name is for your tenant, and they can be given the right to actually just register the information into your uh, autopilot for you. Um, or you can just request them to send you the CSV file, the spreadsheet that has all of the uh, device IDs in it. Now you might say, okay, well what if it's too late? What if I didn't get my OEM to do it? What if I've got all of these machines uh, already set up and I want to um, I want to basically gather the device IDs. Well, there's actually a PowerShell command that you can use to do this, and I'm not going to explain it in this video. I just want to give you the overview of it. There is a PowerShell command that I can run. I can run it remotely. If I have network connectivity with these machines, I could run this machine, run this command from one of these other machines and have it collect all of the device IDs from these new machines. So that's how we can do that. And then we can upload that uh, into into Intune, all right, um, and so that's the idea. So again, once you've collected these device IDs, it's registered in Intune Autopilot. You've created what is called an Autopilot uh, out of box experience configuration profile. Basically, these machines can can boot up. They'll connect into Intune Autopilot. The uh, it will down. They will download that config profile. It'll configure those machines the way you want it to be configured. Whatever software needs to be taken off, it'll autopilot and Intune will instruct it to take it off. Whatever uh, software needs to be put on, it'll install it because you can deploy software through Intune. And then any other configurations you want. Uh, if you want to put restrictions on this machine, like for example, maybe you want to disable the ability to use flash drives on these machines. You can do that with the help of Intune. And autopilot is going to link all of that. Uh, link these devices in so that they get linked into Intune so Intune can tell them what to do. All right. So hopefully this video has been instructive to you and you now have uh, a, a basic idea of what Autopilot is. Now I know I haven't shown you how to use it yet in this video. I just wanted to give you a good visualization of the concepts of Autopilot. And I want to help you understand uh, how we actually go through this process of having devices registered with Autopilot. Now, remember that um, if I was working with an OEM like Dell or HP, they actually have the ability to um, upload device IDs into your environment if you let them know your domain name. All right. Um, but you might have to do this yourself. It could be that uh, you, you don't want them doing it. You could just get a spreadsheet from them with the device IDs in it and you could upload it yourself. Or maybe you're working with a smaller OEM that, uh, that doesn't have a partnership with Microsoft and, and they could provide you with these device IDs and you can put it into a CSV file and upload it yourself. All right. So that's sort of the idea here. Um, and so what I want to show you is uh, where this would be done. So here I am on endpoint.microsoft.com. I'm going to click on devices, all right, and then I'm going to go to um, right here where it says enroll devices under device enrollment. All right, and if I scroll down just a little bit here, this is where it talks about the Windows Autopilot deployment program, and then if you click the devices button here, this is where you would import it. So you could import that spreadsheet right here as a CSV file. All right. Now you might say, well, you know, how how would a, if I had a machine and I wanted to collect the device ID, how could I do that myself? Okay. So if you do a a quick search on um, either Google 
or Bing or whatever, and there there is actually a PowerShell command called get win get dash Windows Autopilot info. You can search for that, and this is the command you do it. But there is a an article that I always like to point out. This is manually register devices with Autopilot. Uh, so you can do this. You can do this with. Um, Config Manager, or you can use Windows PowerShell. In this case, we're going to look at doing this with PowerShell because we don't have Config Manager. All right, so we'll go there, and they tell you the, the series of commands to do this. First off, be advised that there is a command called a script, really, called git windows autopilot info. Now you have to get this script. This script is located in the uh, PowerShell gallery, which is where Microsoft stores all of the latest and greatest scripts. Now you can actually run a command that's going to let you get this script. Install dash script. But there's a couple things we need to do. So let's say I'm sitting at this machine here. This is the machine that I want to collect a um, the device ID. I'm also going to show you how you would do this remotely as well. But I'm going to right click the start button here and I'm going to go to terminal. Okay, or maybe PowerShell, whichever operating system you're using. Okay, and the first thing I need to do is I need to make sure scripts are allowed to be ran. Now, if you didn't know this in PowerShell, there's a thing called the execution policy that will prevent scripts from being ran um, for obviously hacking reasons. But I'm going to type git dash execution policy. Okay. So PowerShell is just kind of lagging a little bit here. There it is. Get execution policy. So you can see right now that it's restricted. I need to change that, or if I try to install a script on this machine, it is going to block me. All right. So um, I'm going to type set dash execution policy, and then I'm going to set say dash execution policy, and I'm just hitting tab to autocomplete, and then I'm going to set that to unrestricted. All right. So now if I type git execution policy, it should say unrestricted. So now I'm okay, I'm able to install this command. So, or install the script. So if I look here at the PowerShell gallery, here's the script, install dash script dash name git windows auto, git dash windows autopilot info. I'm gonna copy that and just run that command here in this PowerShell. So install dash script dash name git windows autopilot info, all right? Now, it is going to say that in order to run scripts, it's got to basically create a, a folder for scripts, and it's got to create what's called a path variable, which is just a place in memory where it can remember where the scripts are. So am I sure I want to do that? Yes. I'm going to hit Enter, and it's going to go ahead and allow that to happen. Now, another thing that might happen is um, if this is the first time you've ever downloaded anything from the PowerShell gallery, it may ask you to install something called NuGet. Um, there it is right there. And all you got to do is say yes to that. It is okay to install NuGet. NuGet is a provider, a service provider for PowerShell that can go out and install PowerShell uh, commands uh, and scripts from the gallery. The next thing it add, it tells you is that you're about to install a command from an untrusted repository, and that sounds scary. The repository is the PowerShell gallery, which is actually owned by Microsoft. Oddly enough, the reason it's called a um, unrestricted repository, though, or um, sorry, untrusted repository is because uh, even though it's owned by Microsoft, it actually is open to the community. So people that don't work for Microsoft can upload commands. The good news is there is a moderation community as well, moderators that check these commands to make sure they aren't malicious. So for the most part, even though it says it's untrusted, you can trust it. Okay, so I've now installed that and uh, I'm ready to run the command that's going to let me get the device ID from a machine. Okay, so I'll just do that. I'm just going to create a folder uh, mkdir uh, ID. All right, so we just created a folder, and you could have done that through File Explorer, but I just created it called ID. So now I'm going to do this. I'm going to type git dash uh, windows autopilot info dot ps1. That's a PowerShell script. Now, just so you know, if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to uh, do this against computers over the network, I would type dash computer name and then whatever the names of the computers are that are on the network. I could put a comma like this, 
and it would actually grab the device IDs for all these machines across the network. Now in my case, I am sitting at the computer where I want to, um, to do this, okay? So um, in my case, I'm just gonna put dash output file C colon slash ID slash device ID dot CSV. And let's see if it works. Okay, so it looks like it did. And I'm gonna open up File Explorer and I'm gonna go to C drive where it says ID and then there is the file right there. Now if you had Excel, uh, you could open this up in Excel and see it or if you don't have Excel, you can open it up in Notepad and see it. All right, so we'll just open that up in Notepad. All right, and all right, so there it is. There's a device ID and it also has a, a, a signature hash value that just verifies mathematically that this ID is correct. Uh, mathematically. So there it is right there. So now if I go back to uh, endpoint uh, dot microsoft dot com, let's go, let's do it from the start, endpoint dot microsoft dot com, click devices, okay, go here where it says enroll devices, scroll down to devices, okay, uh, I can now import that uh, file, that spreadsheet. And if I had collected it from a bunch of computers, then it would have obviously worked for a bunch of computers. So I could then import that in there. And that is how we can uh, import the device IDs into Intune. Okay. So the devices now, we, we register this way, a device could then in turn be reconfigured. Now in this video I was just showing you how to get the device to find the device ID and import the device ID. We're not actually looking at triggering autopilot to take over machine in, right now. I just wanted to show you how this device ID thing works. So hopefully that uh, all makes sense and now you know how you can collect device IDs from machines. And by the way I did want to add I, I waited just a couple minutes so this would finish and I did want to show you that it did finish you can see the serial number here, manufacturer model, because it's a virtual machine, and then it says currently the profile is not assigned. Okay, so that is the state that this will be in uh, when it gets imported. And of course, if I had imported a bunch of these, obviously you'd have a, a different, um, these would be listed right here for you. Okay, all right. But I just wanted to quickly give you that visualization, and um, that is how the device IDs are going to look once they get imported. Now when you're going to use autopilot and you have decided to use device IDs to recognize the machines that are going to get um, reconfigured, uh, there is one thing you have to set up in order for this to work before we can start utilizing deployment, pro deployment profiles and all that. And that is you must have a special type of group that uh, is going to uh, be associated with these devices that have that are utilizing device ID. So just to kind of reiterate what I'm saying, if I go here on endpoint.microsoft.com and I click devices, okay, and I go down here to enroll devices, and then I go to devices under the autopilot deployment pro profile, I have already uh, imported a device ID. The problem is, is I need a way to recognize this utilizing what's called a deployment profile. A deployment profile is going to decide what configuration I'm going to deploy to this machine, but you have to associate that with a group. Okay, so to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to go over here to groups. All right, and we're going to click to create a new group. And uh, this must be a security group because security groups are the only kinds of groups that can contain devices. And then um, the, uh, we'll just give it a name, Autopilot Managed, okay? And the other thing that has to happen is the type of group will need to be a dynamic device because we're gonna create a little rule. Now, what if it wasn't? Well, if it wasn't, you could actually have a group that just has a bunch of devices in it and you could tell Autopilot to manage those devices. But remember, part of the fun of Autopilot is that I, I'm buying a bunch of machines, perhaps, and I want these machines just to boot up and magically know that they're supposed to be managed by autopilot. If you've already got a bunch of machines, yes, you can create a group and you can put them in those machines, or put the groups, put the machine names in the group, okay? You can do that. But then you have to trigger the machines to be reset, which I'm gonna 
Yeah, you know, we'll talk more about that coming up. Um, so the, the idea here, though, is I've got brand new machines that need to be managed by autopilot. So I'm going to do dynamic device, and then I'm going to go to add a query. All right, now if we go um, to, if we go to Google or Bing and just do a quick search for these words, autopilot dynamic security group, Microsoft has an article that we can click on. If we scroll down, they tell you what needs to be typed here. And it's this right here to create a group that includes all your autopilot devices. Okay. Um, you're going to want to put this query in right here. So I'm going to copy that. All right. Copy that uh, information that you see there. They have some other examples too, but for our needs, what we want to do is identify all the devices that have a device ID. So we'll do that. We'll copy that. And now we're going to go right here to where it says edit. We're going to paste this in and we're going to click OK. All right, so we've now um, added this little rule that we that we need in order to make this work. OK, um, so we've got everything in there. Let me just double check. I want to double check and make sure I don't have any errors here. OK, so any errors? No, I think all of this is correct. So I think we should be, I think we should be okay. All right. So everything should be correct. And then I'm going to click save. And then I'm going to click to create this group. All right. So we've now officially got the group that we need in order for autopilot um, profiles to be able to detect any devices that we have associated device IDs with. Now I want to show you the creation of a deployment profile. All right. So this is a, an out of box experience deployment profile that can be managed by Intune. So we'll go right here. I'm just going to open up a new tab for this and that's going to bring us here into devices. All right. And I'm going to go to enroll devices. All right. And here we have deployment profiles. Okay, now notice one thing I do want to point out that I think is very important to understand here is that Autopilot is only available for Windows. It is not available for any other operating system. Okay, so this is why we, we have selected the blade here where it says Windows Enrollment. It is only available, Autopilot is a feature that's only available for uh, Windows. And basically it's Windows 10 and higher, the only operating systems that supported it. So we'll go to Deployment Profiles. And now we're ready to click to create a profile. We're going to go with Windows PC here. All right. And we'll give it a name. Okay. Um, we'll just call this uh, Autopilot Demo. All right. And then it does say, do you want to convert all targeted devices to Autopilot? So this would be if I was using a group. And usually what you do is like if you had a group, um, that uh, you had associated here on the assignments tab. We haven't got there yet, but if you had a, a, a group that you had associated on the assignments tab, it would automatically make them all autopilot devices if you did this, um, if you choose yes to that. Okay, so they're telling you right here, select yes to register all targeted devices to autopilot if they are not already registered. So if they don't already have device IDs, then you could go ahead and um, make them support autopilot. It says the next time registered devices go through the out of box experience, they'll go through the autopilot server. So what is that saying? Well, if you had, if you associated a group over here on the assignments tab that had, let's say, 50 Windows devices that are part of that group, okay? And these are like 50 devices that are already in use by people, okay? And, and you said yes to this, you're basically going to um, make them all autopilot devices. But really, to be honest with you, nothing's going to happen unless you trigger the out-of-box experience by performing a reset on those devices. Okay, so that's all that means. All right. Um, in my case, my device is is a device that I could leave this set to yes or no. It doesn't really matter, and I'm going to get end up with the same out, outcome. All right, so let's take a look at this. And just so you know, this screen changes. It feels like it changes every week. So it would not be surprised. I would not be surprised if it looks a little different 
um, if you're watching this video, just because it's like it seems like it changes every week. But anyway, um, so how is this? Uh, we have a deployment mode. We can do user driven or self deployment. Um, user driven is means that the user will have a little bit more control over the um, the out of box experience. They'll have a little bit more control over the out of box experience than they would um, if if you chose uh, self deployment. You'll notice that if you choose self deployment some of the stuff gets gets grayed out okay uh, so they don't get to change or mess with any of this stuff I'm gonna do user driven and then it says do you wanna do you wanna show the oh and then it says join Azure AD so I can say join Azure AD or if I, I wanna do hybrid I can have a hybrid domain join if I want uh, I'll just leave it set to join Azure AD right now it says Microsoft software terms do you want to show the, the terms and make the user accept those or do you want to hide them? And keep in mind if you choose hide, you're basically uh, accepting the terms on behalf of the user. Privacy, same thing. You choose hide, you're accepting on behalf of the user. Uh, this right here, hide change account options, I highly recommend you don't allow a user to choose if they're going to be an admin. <laughs> okay, uh, So I can, I can go with that, hide, or the default type of, of user that, that, on, that will be on this machine will be a standard user. Okay. The next thing available here is the allow pre-provision deployment option. This is uh, this used to be called the white glove feature. Um, this is a scenario in which if you had a bunch of machines that needed to be uh, reset very quickly, you can have software and everything just already installed on the machine. And so what this basically does is it says, hey, when you when you run autopilot, I don't want to wipe any of those applications. Let's just keep everything in there. I'm not going to get into a lot of depth on that. You can research that a little bit more and, it'll, and you can learn how to configure and set that up. But I'm not really getting into that in this video. But that's what this is going to do for us. Here I've got language uh, region. So I can set that to whatever I want. If I want to go with uh, language default there, I can. And then you can set keyboard, automatically set the keyboard to yes or no or let the user choose. Or the user will have an opportunity to change it if you do user-driven anyway. And then finally, you can have a device name template. So whatever you want this device to be called. So I want to set this to, you know, whatever I want this device to be named, I can do that. All right. So I can enter in a name here. Um, now, what you can do is you can put something like, the name of your company, exam lab practice in my case, and then you could do, like what they show as an example, you say, give it a random number. So I could say ELP dash percent rand colon five percent. That's gonna generate a five digit random number, okay? Um, generally speaking, you do wanna have some kind of a, you know, unique name that, uh, that you go with, okay? I'm just gonna put this in here because I've just got one machine that I'm doing this with. All right. So I'll click um, I'll click next and then this is where I'm going to set assignments. So uh, I'm going to cl click to add a group. All right. And the group I'm going to put is the autopilot managed group. And you'll notice you can do exclusion groups. I'm not going to get into a lot of details on that right now. Generally speaking, anytime in Intune though, you have what's called an included group and an excluded group. Uh, excluded groups always override included groups. So if you had a scenario where um, a device or a user was a, a member of both groups, it would get excluded. If you added, you know, if I had, like, let's say I had a group called sales and another group called marketing and I had, uh, a, you know, a device that was a member of both groups, well, it would get excluded. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. This video is not really explaining that in detail, but I'm just adding an included group here and that's going to be the autopilot managed group. At that point, we're going to click next and we're going to click create. We've now created our profile. Okay, something else that I want to do um, that is necessary, I want to make sure that what is known as auto enrollment is turned on and um, within our autopilot environment. If this is a new, if this is a new version of Intune, it may not be. So this is something that um, that we definitely have to keep in mind. So if I go over here to devices and I go to enroll devices, I want to go here to automatic enrollment, and I just want to make sure that. Um, that, that this is set to all for MDM and all for MAM, and I need to click Save. Now again, if this is a new uh, Intune environment for you, these are probably set to none, so you need to turn that on, okay? Um, another thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump over to portal.azure.com. It's gonna bring me over to Azure. I wanna take a look at Azure Active Directory. 
So once I get to portal.azure, I'm going to click the menu button and go to Azure Active Directory. All right. And I'm going to scroll down. And I'm going to go here where it says Company Branding. All right. And so right here, it, um, it asks me what I want the sign-in experience to look like when somebody signs in. Default sign-in, I can customize what it's going to look like. I can add a logo and stuff like that. In my case, um, you know, I just, I'm not going to add any kind of a logo or uh, any of that stuff. But you could if you want to add a color, background, any of that. Um, so let's see if there's anything else. There's sign-in, form, banners, a logo. So there's a, I do want to add some sign-in text. I'm going to say, welcome to exam lab practice. So I am going to put that. And then um, I'm going to click review and create and click create. So when somebody is setting up, if their machine's being logged in to uh, this to autopilot, it should say welcome to exam lab practice. All right. So at that point, we have now, um, we have now finished setting up our profile for autopilot. We've created a group, created our profile. And uh, so that is how you're going to go through that process of setting up a uh, autopilot deployment profile. I'd like to show you another feature we have in regards to Intune and Autopilot known as the Enrollment Status Page. So to, to look at this, we got to go to endpoint.microsoft.com and we're going to click on Devices. All right, if we click on Enroll Devices, this is where you'll see that we have this Enrollment Status Page button. So we'll click on that. You can see that um, by default, we just have a default uh, Enrollment Status Page uh, configuration that's set to all users and all devices, okay? So this is just assigned to everybody. Now, if we wanted to, we could create separate uh, page profiles and assign those to specific uh, groups, users, devices, whatever they may be, okay? Um, or we could edit the default one. I'll click on properties here and you can see that uh, this is gonna tie to all users and I click on settings, Right now, it says the enrollment page appears during the initial device setup and during first user sign-in. If enabled, users can see the configuration process of assigned apps and profiles targeted to their device. Show app and profile configuration progress. So currently, it's set to no, which means it's not showing any progress when a user is waiting on things to get installed. So with like Autopilot, when this is all being deployed, they're not getting any kind of progress uh, uh, information. I can click yes and then I can answer certain questions like show an error when installation takes longer than 60 minutes, show custom messages if you want, turn on uh, log collection diagnostics, only show page to devices uh, provisioned by out-of-box experience, block device uh, use until all apps and profiles are installed so you can make it where they can't log on. So there's various things here you can do, allow user to reset device during the installation if it errors, allow user to use device installation errors, block device use until required apps are installed if they are assigned to the user or device. So you can go through here and you can save all of this if you want. So the other thing I can do is if I want to just configure this again for a specific group, I could click create and I'll say, um, you know, just NYC client 11, if that's the name of your machine, Go to settings, set this to what you want. So I can go through here and you know set this to yes, 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 specify, you know, whatever I want to enable here. Uh, and then click next, and then I would just assign it to that group, right? So I have that autopilot group. Click select, click next. You can specify something called admin scope tag. So I'm not really going to get into the details here. This is for admins though, what they can see. But we'll click next and click uh, create. And at that point, you'll see this has a priority one. So this will override the default. And if I created another one, you can move up, move down the priority. Okay. And so that's how that's going to work. All right. So that is what the enrollment status page is. Nothing, nothing spectacular, but it can provide some information and also a couple extra features for a user if, uh, if they get an error. Okay, so here I am back on this machine. This is the machine that I gathered the device ID for. Uh, we have already added that device ID right here in the autopilot. Okay, we've created a group for our autopilot. 
and we've also created a deployment profile, an out-of-box experience deployment profile. So if we go and we look back here on enroll devices and deployment profiles, we have our deployment profile right here. So now what I'm going to do on this machine is I am going to right click the start button, click run, and I'm going to type sysprep. This is going to trigger this machine to go into the out-of-box experience. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, click OK, and we're going to trigger this to happen. Now keep in mind if this was a new machine that you just bought and you just plugged it in, this new machine would already be set to the out-of-box experience. So it could just be plugged in, booted up, and it should work. So let's go ahead and click OK. Okay, so this is just right in the middle of this machine going through the, the process of uh, the sysprep and the reboot. And I just check it in. I'm going to pause the recording while this loads through. Okay, so I want you to notice that uh, it says, Welcome to Exam Lab Practice. So there's our little uh, banner uh, sign-in text. And I'm going to go ahead and put in my credentials here. All right, so it should be uh, able to authenticate. And uh, I will go ahead and pause the recording while this is processing. Okay, now notice that um, it is showing some progress. It's showing the device preparation, device setup, and account setup. So we will uh, just wanted to show you this progress. And of course, this, this process obviously does take some time, and I'm kind of speeding through pausing the recording and all of that so that you're not having to wait. But just know that this does take some time. All right, so the next thing it says after it runs through the three sections, you'll notice it says this may take a few minutes. It says don't turn off the PC. So this is the next little step that's happening. All right, and so I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording and let this process through. Okay, so here I am on the log on screen. My resolution is a little bit small, but I'm going to go ahead now and uh, authenticate putting in my credentials and um, let it let that process through here but the machine has been reset um, and everything did work as it was supposed to so we've now got this machine set up and linked with the help of, uh, of uh, autopilot and the device should be showing up inside of uh, Intune Something else I can do is go here to settings and once I get into settings, I'll just go right here and just search for the word work. All right, this lets me basically find the workplace or school or access work or school. So I'll click on that. All right, you can see that it is connected to exam lab practice. Now I will tell you that I did not, when I was setting up the deployment profile, I did not tell it to join the domain. So currently it is not jo uh, joined to my Microsoft Active Directory domain, but I don't really need that right now. All I wanted was for it to be joined to Azure Active Directory, and that's kind of what I wanted out of this uh, demonstration. So we are good to go on that. Jumping back into endpoint.microsoft.com now, I just wanted to show you a couple things. First off, if I click on devices and I go to Windows, you can see that my new device has been added. This is an older device. Don't worry about that. This is my new device. I haven't done any kind of compliance checking on it, so you'll see it, you'll see it is not uh, evaluated, but it is showing up, this uh, NYC client 11B, which is what I named it. Uh, and if I jump back over to devices again and I go to enroll devices and I look at right here where it says autopilot deployment program, go to devices there. Okay, you'll, you'll see that the um, uh, device ID says assigned now as the status, right? So that that is uh, doing exactly what we expected it to. And then if I come back over here to enroll devices deployment profiles, I can also see that this is the assigned deployment profile, and I can even see the assigned devices that it's associated with, which is that serial number there. Okay. All right. So that hopefully now helps you with a good have a good understanding of this whole process with um, setting up the uh, autopilot and going through the, the visualization of um, the actual profile being deployed to a machine.
Hey, this is John Christopher. I hope you enjoyed getting to experience a little bit of this course, and I hope you'll join me on the full adventure. If you'll check the description of this video, you'll see a link that'll show you how you can get access to the full course. Now, in the full course, you're going to learn how to set up a practice environment where you can practice hands-on, and I'm going to provide you with lots of virtual simulations that you can do 24-7. All you need is a web browser. So I hope you'll join me, and uh, I hope you'll also give me a like and subscribe. I'm trying very, very hard to get the this channel to build and grow, and uh, so I hope you'll take the time to do that.